when it comes to programming, there's certain problems that you're going to see over and over again. But you don't have to come up with a brand new solution each time you run into those problems. My name is Terrence with Java Code Geeks, and today we're going to talk about software design patterns, an awesome tool for you to write cleaner, more efficient code. Okay, guys, now before we get started, if you look down in the description, you'll see all of the related articles and content from the Java Code Geeks website, where you can stay up to date with everything Java related. Now, if you're enjoying this content, please smush that like button and hit that subscribe button. That way you can stay up to date with everything we have coming out here. With that being said, let's get started. All right, guys, so here we are, and we're ready to talk about some software design patterns. We're going to take a look at a couple of de definitions and lay a good groundwork uh, before we look at some co actual code examples of software design patterns. So with that being said, let's get started there. So uh, what is a design pattern? So a design pattern is basically a widespread and reusable uh, way of solving a certain problem in software engineering. So it's not meant to be copy and pasted, right? Uh, so Stack Overflow, you know, you're not gonna copy and paste this in, but what you are, are gonna, going to be able to do is look at the problem you're currently facing and look at the way this has been accepted as being worked on and fixed uh, with uh, the current software uh, design pattern implementations that we're going to look at. Uh, there's numerous. Uh, there's a numerous amount. Uh, the numbers vary on the total amount, but you know, obviously, technology is always evolving, and uh, you know, what's what's uh, current today is going to be old news tomorrow. So, uh, but this, this is just at its very foundation is a way to solve a software engineering problem that commonly occurs. So why do we use these design patterns? Well, you don't want to reinvent the wheel, right? So if there's an expertly way, uh, uh, expertly found way to solve a certain problem in software engineering and has been proven to work and it gets you the best results, you know, you don't want to go out there and, and you know, try and pine. Obviously, if there's a better way to do it, we can, you know, maneuver that. But, uh, you know, throughout time, uh, these, these uh, different skills and different uh, patterns have been acquired and collected and they've been shown to solve different problems. And like we said, this is not copy and pasting the code in. This is not, you know, taking their code and just copying it word for word. All this is is looking at, say, for example, a creational design pattern or a structural design pattern. And you're looking at the problem you currently have. And then you're just uh, uh, implementing that for your, your, your particular problem. So uh, it increases the flow of communication between developers. You could say, hey, why don't we try the dependency injection pattern? Why don't we try this pattern? And, and they'll know what you're talking about. And you say, oh, I didn't think about it that way. So this is just a tried and tested, proven ways to solve different problems in software engineering. So very useful. So what are the advantages of design patterns? So like we said, this is just a proven way to solve this. So in, rather than having to go in and try and come up with your own solution that's brand new and it could be wrong, it could be very wrong, um, as sometimes in off software engineering, you might, you might think, you know, you're, you're, you you spend all this time working on a certain problem and you might be tired and, you know, you, you think you're, you're onto this big chase and you're, and you just figured out, uh, you know, this, this big thing, but you could have just looked at a design pattern and saw, oh, that's a really good way of doing this. You know, maybe I, I should try and implement this somehow and work it into my code since this has been proven to work over and over again and it's testable and I can just work it in. So they're generally accepted, right? Uh, it's going to be rare where you bring this up and you say, hey, why don't we try this this proven and tested design pattern? And someone's going to say, uh, you know, I'm just going to make up my own way. That's not really going to happen very commonly. Uh, these are tr tried and tested, proven. Um, they've been put through the to the uh, to the test to show that they work there. So now uh, once we get, once again, these are not this is not a copy and paste uh, drill. All this is is looking at the code and looking for a way to implement it for your own code. So uh, you still have to come up with your own implementation, right? This is not going to be a fresh out of the box. Hey, or, you know, here's this design pattern. Okay, now we're now we're good. You, you're going to have to look at your code, look at the situation you're facing, and obviously look at all the names of your variables and implement this the way that that it should be done. Now, um, so previously completed solutions. Uh, could, you know, they could mess with the current thought process of your team or the group that you're working with. Somebody might think of it of a different way. Uh, they might say, you know, that that's not going to help us. And it's all about communication. But uh, like we mentioned before, these are some of the disadvantages is, uh, you know, you want to make sure you communicate what you're trying to do exactly. 
And uh, once again, you still have to come up with your own implementation, right? So you can you even though these are are given uh, uh, blueprints to figuring out your problem, you still have to come up with your own solution at the end of the day um, in its very detailed uh, format. So uh, ca uh, categorizing design patterns. So in order to categorize a design pattern, these are actually uh, signified by the different problems that they they solve. So like we mentioned before, you have behavioral problems in your code. You need a certain behavior to be enacted. We're going to look at some of that today. Uh, to the three examples we're going to look at today are creational, structural, and behavioral design patterns. Now, there's numerous design patterns, and, and, and you know, one would even argue that they're growing each day. Uh, there's a there's a team called the Gang of Four, and they have a great book out there on design patterns. I haven't read it in depth yet, uh, but I've been looking over it. And they basically go over the top, I believe they said 23 design patterns where they categorize the different problems that they were solving and the way you can look at your code. And, and uh, from what I understand, if you if you read through that entire book, it'll revolutionize revolutionize the way that you look at your code. I'm not endorsing that or or uh, but, you know, these these are the guys that are pretty much have coined the term in the software engineering industry. And, uh, you know, just re related patterns are, are, what gonna, are what's going to allow it to be categorized. You know, it solves this problem this way. It solves that problem that way, so on and so forth. So creational patterns. So creational patterns give an approach to creating objects while hiding the way that the objects instantiated. So if you've been working with object-oriented programming for any length of time, you realize that you have to use that new keyword or whatever keywords um, useful in your programming language in order to instantiate that object. But when you do that, you're hard coding it. So we're going to look at a couple of examples. Some examples of this are a singleton pattern, prototype pattern, dependency injection pattern, um, things of that nature. So the creational patterns, you're, you're looking to create an object, hide the way it's being implemented, hide the way that it's being instantiated there. With a structural pattern, what we're looking at is a way to structure the code. So you have a certain problem, you have a certain data set, you have a certain aspect of your code that needs to be implemented a certain way. And in order for your code to be structured a certain way, you can look at some design patterns and say, okay, I have a problem with my code. Um, I don't want anybody to be able to touch this certain variable. And you know, if somebody touches it, it's gonna ruin the whole program. So how can I structure my code so that nobody can touch this certain variable. And we're going to look at an example with that, with the private class data. And we're just going to touch on it because if you know the different access modifiers for programming, you can understand this very quickly um, and how, how useful that can be uh, for your particular program. Now, when it comes to behavioral patterns, this is all about the behavior of your code. When, I, when, when the user does this, I need my code to behave this way. When this situation arises or this state happens, as in the state design pattern, I need my code to change and do this. You know, the iterator pattern, right? It's, it's dealing with the behavior of the, of the code. Uh, if you dealt with algorithms, you know, the iterator is going to go throughout a data structure, uh, no matter what data structure it is. And that's all um, abstracted. You know, you don't have to see all the little bits of code that where it's using to iterate through that data structure. Uh, the no object pattern. So all these are, have been used to solve different problems throughout time in regard to software engineering. So um, that was our PowerPoint presentation on software engineering, uh, <clears throat> the, the, the different patterns of software engineering. What we're going to look at now is a couple of code examples. All right, guys. So here we are. We're going to take a look at our uh, examples of design patterns, software engineering design patterns. That's what we're talking about today. And what we want to take a look at, ex uh, for example, first is the structural design pattern. We're going to cover three different examples, the structural design pattern, the creational design pattern, and the behavioral design pattern. The, uh, so first, we're going to touch on the structural design pattern. Now, this is all about the structure of your code, the makeup of your program, um, how it's going to be used, and how it's going to be accessed. Now, what we're going to take a look at for, for this example is the private access modifier that's used here. This is called the private class data, pa data pattern. And what this means is that only this class is able to use this variable here. There is no other class in the entire program that can use that specific variable because it's private, right? You have default access, public, protected, then you have private. And private means this is only accessible by this class, only the class. Now, uh, this is just a quick example just to show that, you know, say, for example, you had a particular variable and you didn't want anybody else to be able to touch it. You know, if, if this if this variable is is um, interrupted or or, or changed uh, inadvertently, this is going to mess up your program. That's when you would want to use this. You want to structure your program, use the structural design pattern and uh, utilize that for your team there. 
Secondly, what we're going to look at is a dependency injection pattern for the creational design pattern for uh, software engineering. Now, what, what do we, um, before in the PowerPoint, what did we say? We said that the creational design pattern deals with this idea of hiding the way the product, the object is instantiated. We want to basically abstract that and basically just be able to use the, the object and just keep that out of the, the eye of the user or or just be able to use the object however we, want, we would want to without having to hard code it in there. So this is where dependency injection comes in and is great at this. Say, for example, we had a certain database that relied on a certain object. And one day this, this database becomes corrupt or we, we're, we're moving on to a be bigger, better database that's, you know, maybe cheaper to maintain or however. And so we would use, we would just swap out the object that was working with that. We could just as easy, as easily as that, we could just change this, this object here. And believe it or not, this is actually instantiating an object, right? We're creating this object and this is called setter injection, right? So we're injecting this object into this other uh, this method here, uh, we're accessing its methods here. Now, so we have this method called set dog sounds. So we have this object that's created through setter injection and it's called dog sound. So this dot dog sound equals dog sound, just like any other setter method. But now we can access the methods based off of this, uh, the setter that's being set here, this object that's being created. So as we said, there's no new keyword, right? We could have used a new keyword, but then it would be hard coded in here. But we were able to just instantiate this object and utilize the methods that are associated with just like that. We have constructor injection, another example of dependency injection, right? So when this is, item is going to be constructed, right, this is a constructor here because a, a setter is a method, right? So it has a return type, which is void in this case. This is a constructor because it doesn't have a return type. It looks like a method, but no return type. And we have this here, this constructor here, and it's going to actually just in the same way instantiate this object from the constructor. So believe it or not, we can access the methods just like how we could access another object's methods just by looking at this, uh, by, just by using constructor injection from the dependency injection pattern of the creational design pattern. Okay, then you have field injection, right? Same, same idea. Lastly, what we're gonna look at is this big example here of the behavioral design pattern for a state. So this, this design pattern basically allows for the creation of, of, of a state flow, right? So in this example, we're going from an ATM that has money into it, and then you basically withdraw all your money, and then you don't have any money in there, right? So it has to change state. Now you might say, you know, why can't we just create a, you know, a switch statement, or, or why can't we just do a bunch of if-else statements? Well, this is much cleaner. This is much easier to read. And with the state design pattern, it's much easier to test. Right. So we can test these specific, um, these specific, specific methods that are in interacting within our program here. And as it changes state, we can basically test this and make sure we're getting the proper result. Right. So you, you always want to utilize test driven development whenever, uh, well, actually that's pretty much what you want to do there. A lot of people, there's a lot of speculation on that and a lot of, uh, you know, people don't believe that, but but there's a lot of people that do believe that that when you can build a program and it's based on the test that you're running, that way if something breaks, you can go in there and say, okay, this is what broke, this is why it broke. So testing is being is is very important for your program, and this allows us to do that because look, now we have a separation of concerns. Every method does one thing, right? We don't have a method that does four different things. We're able to test each of these now. And with a, with the switch statement, now we have one method that's just switching around, just going through the motions and, and whatever, you know, whatever, uh, whatever is entered, it just goes through that. With state, we can make sure this is working properly, right? So, you know, I don't think anybody would underestimate the necessity of, of testing in today's uh, software environment. So when we look at this here, we have this state down here. So this is the first state, which is functioning, right? So it implements state of ATM machine, which is an interface. And as you know, with the interface, you have to find an implementation whenever this interface is implemented of the methods contained therein. So just in, just because of that, we have the functioning here and it has to have its own example of the withdrawal method. And it has to have its own example of the make deposit method, right? So if you didn't know that uh, interface, you have to find the, uh, you have to make your own implementation of the methods found in that interface. Uh, that's being implemented. And just in the same way, this is the second state, right? So it's going to implement state of ATM machine. It has to have its own implementations of those two methods, make a deposit and withdraw. And you can see here where it changes state. We have the special method called set state, right? Where it's making a new, no cash available ATM, 
which is located right here. So when we do that, this code is actually switching between the state. We don't need a switch statement. This is actually much cleaner, much easier to read, uh, much easier to fix if anything goes wrong. And we just, we, we're changing between states and this is behavioral design pattern, right? So we wanna make sure this code behaves the way we want it to and it does everything we need it to do. Now, uh, you might say, you know, I still think we should use a switch statement. Well, you can, but this is much cleaner. This is much easier to test, so on and so forth. I'm sure uh, whoever you're working with or whoever comes after you to look at your, your code would be much appreciative if, if you left this for them rather than a bunch of, uh, you know, a bunch of string code. So we're going to run this code here today. We're going to run it just to kind of show where it's switching back, back and forth between the states uh, for our final code example here. And we're just going to run this here. Um, okay. There we go. Now, when we run this, code when we hit this play button right here which is going to allow this code to run okay so we see right here a hundred dollars is deposited deposited sixty dollars is withdrawn forty dollars is withdrawn no funds available so right then and there when we took out that last bit of money it went ahead and changed to the no funds available state right the no fund state so when we did that here we can see that it accessed this method from the second state. So it started out in the first state and said, hey, there's you know new available cash equals zero. Uh-oh, we need to go to the no cash available state. It bounces over down here and goes to no cash available state. But now we when it, we deposited $60 because it has its own implementation of the make deposit method. Now it's back up to the other state. Okay, so now we have money. All right, so now we have to create a new state. We're gonna set the state to a new functioning ATM because we have money now. It just switched state just like that. Like we said, this is much cleaner, much easier to read. And um, then we tried to withdraw money again. So now we, we went back from a functioning to a non-functioning state. And you can use this for whatever example you, you, you would need, any kind of code base you would need. And like we said, the design patterns are just come with this idea of fixing problems that are gonna be seen over and over again uh, for the perceivable feature, uh, future of software engineering. All right, guys, and that's going to end our structural, um, creational, and behavioral design pattern examples. All right, guys, well, thank you for watching that video. Please remember to smush that like button and hit that subscribe notification bell. We have more great content coming out soon. Bye.